uh, again, Kevin, Adolfo, uh, Josh C, Cynthia, uh, you know, chime in if there's something you agree or disagree with, just let, let folks know that. So, um, first off, let me say that to, to understand this project, um, you don't start with this project, right? You cannot start with Cooperation Jackson. Cooperation Jackson is not even four years old. Right? So it's it's a baby. Uh, uh, in the terms in, of, of this project and of this history. Um, now most of the forces, or at least I would say the guiding forces, uh, and I make a distinction between the guiding forces and the participating forces. And we can we can we can talk about that later. But the guiding forces come out of a political tendency. Uh, that's best described as the New African Independence Movement, right? And so to understand that history, you have to go back to 1968 as a point of departure. Not a starting point, but as a point of departure. Uh, and why do I say that? Because some of the, the principal uh, players um, who wind up, say, playing a key role in the narrative, um, they begin to move here in 1970 and 1971 uh, after a decision was made within the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa uh, because it was a conference called the Black Government Conference, self government Conference that happened in, in uh, Detroit, uh, Michigan in 1968 out of which came a declaration of independence and the, the construction of a new organization uh, government in exile, uh, the, the provisional government, the, that's the provisional, of the Republic of New Africa. So there's the idea of this republic, and then, then, then there's the idea of this government in exile, right? And underneath that, there's an idea of a nation, uh, an oppressed nation within the settler colonial project that is the United States. Critical things to understand, like to understand a lot of this project in this history. Uh, so in 1970, a decision winds up being made, uh, which results in uh, kind of a division within this overall project. Uh, some people may know um, uh, there was an organization out of Detroit called Gold, and it was uh, uh, in part uh, a division of RAM, the Revolutionary Action Movement. Uh, I'm going to be throwing a bunch of things that you're going to go look at later to understand uh, uh, this history that I'm not going to have time to explain it all. Uh, but out of gold uh, came two of the principal uh, leaders who wind up giving shape and clarity to the provisional government of the Republic of New Africa. Uh, the the uh, very uh, names uh, were uh, uh, the Miltons. Uh, uh, and their uh, liberated name was the Obadelics. So there was Gaidi and there was uh, Amari. Gaidi being the older, Amari being the younger. Uh, and uh, they had a difference in 1970 around uh, how to move strategically. Amari proposed, the younger proposed that uh, the provisional government um, actually take a seat uh, in constructing its, its uh, capital, if you would, and that would be here in Mississippi, not too far outside of, of Jackson. Um, and that they initially set up a house, which is less than half a mile away from here, the original house, and, and, the, and part of the reason why we're in this neighborhood, so, the, so you understand the relevancy uh, of it. Um, that wind up being the, the, the basic organizing uh, spot uh, that they started from, but the decision uh, wind up creating some division. Um, and a lot of the younger folks, I would argue, and this is shorthand and there's a lot to dispute, but a lot of the younger folks, in, including one person who becomes very central to this narrative, uh, Chokwe Lumumba, side with Imari, and uh, he moves from Detroit here to Jackson, Mississippi, uh, to take part in helping to establish this capital. So to understand Cooperation Jackson, I'm gonna have to cut now, like some years, but to understand Cooperation Jackson and where it comes from, you would miss a lot of the boat if you don't understand that the foundations around the organizing start in the early 1970s, late 1960s. And that there's an ongoing stream and continuity from then to now 
in the organizing work that has happened here with ups and downs and peaks and valleys uh, to get a sense of where this emerged from. Like it don't, it didn't just pop up out of thin air. It didn't just emerge out of a couple of people's, you know, individual heads uh, or anything of that nature. That, like there's a foundation uh, that was laid before many of us in this room were born, right? So key thing to understand. Now fast forward. Um, um, uh, this is the part I, I would say gets more uh, personal and I play much more of a central role uh, um, in this story. So in 2000, um, 2001, uh, after September uh, 11th happened, uh, at the time I was a member of the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. Uh, and there was a small group of us who were then in the national leadership who recognized after September 11th that that was going to be a political shift of a major significance. Um, and I think we correctly analyzed that a lot of the ways in which we were organizing and working, that those doors were closed. Uh, and that we were going to have to shift and make some adjustments. Uh, and so even how, to give a sense of how much things have changed uh, between now and, and then, uh, we've changed a lot of the rhetoric and language. I saw that coming, I didn't, didn't want to say that. <laughs> uh, uh, we even had to change a lot of the language that we use, right? Um, and I think a lot of us have done this somewhat subconsciously. Um, but uh, that organization, that movement, already had a history of being labeled terrorists. Mm -hmm. And so understanding that in an earlier generation when th those terms were used, uh, they were often used for political purpose, but they did not necessarily carry the full weight of law right. as it was, was, was then uh, um, practiced, let's put it that way. And what do I mean by that? So those designations were used to describe folks from the Black Panther Party who became political prisoners and prisoners of war, uh, uh, Moog family, uh, people in the provisional government, uh, people in the Black Liberation Army. So it's not like we hadn't used, heard these terms used against some of our comrades and, and compadres before. The difference was COINTELPRO was fundamentally a, an illegal program according to their own law but it got all the protections of law, which is why there's still political prisoners and prisoners of war from that era still in prison now. But we understood that there was already a clear program that they were, that some reactionary forces were speaking about. Uh, I don't know if folks remember what was in uh, that paper, one of the most influential, the program for a new America, or I forget the exact name of the, the program that uh, uh, came out. George Bush wound up following a lot of this program and brought a lot of these folks. Project for a New American Century. Project for a New right. American Century. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it had some, if you go back and look at it, it had some titles on how they were going to, if they had the opportunity, they were going to reshape, you know, the, the international system, right? And, and reshape the domestic system. So us being political beasts, we're studying our, our enemy to understand what moves that they would make. Um, and so that was when we clearly recognized this is an opportunity for them, despite all Serpent's appearances, and they're going to utilize this to the fullest. And so we are going to be one of the targets that they will wind up using under this new designation. So um, out of that, we stopped speaking about, for instance, to give you a shift to what I mean by the language shifting. Our organization stopped talking about national liberation. When you say our organization? The, the, the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. Right, thank you. Right? We stopped talking about national liberation. So if you go back and look at a lot of the, the, the official writings that, that came out of that organization, you'll notice that shift from, from basically September 2000, you know, say August 2001, you know, say August 2001 to uh, October 2001, there's a different language, right? That winds up being used and it took us some time to figure out well, what is the language we want to use to describe the goals and objectives that wouldn't have us 
necessarily be automatically designated as a terrorist organization and a terrorist threat. Now, why am I bringing this all up? Because if, if uh, uh, it's not abstract, nor is it without history or precedent, nor is it anything new that like uh, uh, the FBI just made this designation uh, that there are black, uh, what is it, uh, black identity extremists, extremists right? Uh, um, you know, so they've come up with a new language to suit the times of, of new organizing forms, but the political aims and objectives are still uh, the same, which is to weaken and undermine and destroy this movement, right? Uh, and understanding that we are perpetual targets of, you know, uh, their angst and their ire. Now, but one of the critical link things leading up to this is that there was a small group tank, group think group within the organization that got developed after September 11th. That wind up first producing like a five-year strategy, and then out of that five-year strategy, at a critical point, uh, we began to focus in on a strategy which is now called the Jackson Bush Plan. Right? Uh, and that plan speeded up. That plan really had some adjustments made to it uh, as a result of Hurricane Katrina. And the collective understanding of that organization about the, the, the immediate threat and danger posed to climate change and what that, what that was doing and could do politically. Now, why is that a central concern uh, uh, of, of our forces? Number one, the vast majority of people of African descent in this empire live in the southern states. As true as, you know, 100 years ago as it's true now. Um, and that if you look at most of these southern states, most of them are at or have substantial areas that are below sea level. Right? So the, the immediate impacts of what we saw in New Orleans are now what we've seen in Houston that's going to disproportionately impact people of African descent immediately here in the United States. So it's not like some abstract uh, entity and we've been trying to get people, like it may not be a primary focus, but to the extent that the capitalist system in the United States government uh, makes no forward motion to really addressing this problem, it's, it's, it constitutes an existential threat to your existence. At least here, or at least in these areas, right? And that we need to take this series as a consequence of our own survival and start planning and organizing on that basis. So uh, out of that, there were some other things that we recognized that just the, the, the depopulation of uh, New Orleans um, made a profound shift in the politics of Louisiana and actually changed the, 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 the dynamics of Congress and the Senate. Right? And it moved things further to the right as the black population was removed from that area, basically forbidden to, to, to vote from being displaced. Uh, and it changed Louisiana politics, which changed national politics. That's a story that's not deeply enough told, but it's one that we paid attention to. And so out of that, here in, within that organization, there was a thing about, we can't keep doing the same old thing. Where can we sharpen up uh, and actually uh, focus in and build some power, right? To create a model uh, uh, in essence. And that is where the Jackson Kush plan started to really be formulated and thought through from like 2005 on, right? Um, in 2008, uh, there was a suggestion um, made that uh, uh, Chokwe Lumumba run for mayor, mayor come out, coming out of uh, this strategy. And out of that, um, um, and that was a suggestion made by folks within that organization on a national level. I was one of the people, one of the two people initially made that suggestion. I was not living in Jackson at the time. I was a part of the study group that was analyzing Jackson, but I was not here. And then the, the folks in the chapter here uh, pushed back on that a bit and said that they had already made some commitments as, an, as a chapter uh, to support an existing mayoral candidate, uh, but that to give it a give it a run and to give some uh, 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 to run as a city council person, right? But here's a critical thing that I think speaks to the conjunction, and I think folks want to know like lessons and try to, to answer it. So this is one of the things that that I 
am, am drawing as a critical lesson, which is about political clarity. I'm, I'm sorry. To clarify, this organization, that you were a part of the study group, is that the GNA that was doing this? Or? No, this is the Malcolm X grassroots movement. MXG. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about 2005 to 2009. That was MXG. PG still exists, yes. uh, but it's not, it's a foundation, but it, it wasn't central to these decisions. Just so everybody to be, these immediate decisions that I'm talking about. So the, this piece around political clarity, uh, I can only speak as an individual. I'm not going to speak for anybody else on this point. But me articulating the point around running for an election had to do with organizing. It did not have to do with actually winning an election. So I want to be clear. So if you, because if you go back and you look at my own personal record with some reactionary forces here, I've done. I rarely have ever voted for anything within the empire. Right? It's not a, a particular principal point of my politics or organization to be involved in the politics of the the, the settler power. Right? Uh, we don't get to vote on capitalism. We don't get to vote on imperialism. Uh, so I'm like, what am I voting for outside of a tactical expediency? And unless there's some real critical need to, that is going to move something strategically, I figure it's a waste of time. I'm just being couple like honest with you. So here, the, the critical piece that I was trying to articulate was after some 30 plus years of doing work uh, as a movement, Let's draw out and figure out who in this community agreed with what we agreed to, to our politics and our program. And once we could identify those people, if that was 500, if that was 5,000, if that was 10,000, that's an organic base that we could then go to, appeal to, and begin to organize to build power, which is different than holding office, right? Holding office may enable you to have some ability to wield power, but it is not power in and of itself, which comes from people being organized and understanding their capacities to act in the real world. Like that, that's a different thing. I think we all need to be clear about that. Um, and in that discussion, I think in that initial moment is, is where some of the, the, the conjuncture and the, the uh, the tension within our overall project kind of emerged because there was two different different definitions of what victory would entail that got established at that moment, right? As a result of a compromise. So some of my uh, uh, comrades had made an argument that they didn't want to, in, to be involved in a symbolic uh, race, that they wanted to, uh, they were going to do this, that they wanted to win. We did not agree upon what winning meant. We sidestepped that question, and we did not have a deep enough discussion about clarity. So can I interrupt for just one second? Because you were talking about the struggle for clarity. Right. So as you look back in the spirit of constructive critique, self-critique, was that a mistake at the time, or was it something that just y'all, if you had tried to do it, the whole thing would implode? How important is that struggle for clarity around that moment? It's, it's centrally, that's why I'm going to, it's centrally important. I thought that might be right. the answer, but. It's centrally important. Um, and for my part, I think it was a mistake. It was an error on my part to not push for greater clarity, particularly as one who was presenting the idea, right? And just saying, okay, I can roll with that. And I'm going, in that essence, there's a, there was a, uh, uh, an element within the, the culture which I don't, of the organization, which I don't think necessarily was wrong, but I think at this point needed to be pushed. And that element was a critical thing why I brought it up. I didn't live in Jackson at the time. And so it was a critical thing for me to say, as, and I was a national organizer of the, the organization at the time. So it's like my role is to promote this, this program, right? I'm not going to be a primary person, because I didn't live here, carrying the water on how things were going to be executed there. So for me, I didn't, for the, like I backed up and said the folks who actually have to carry that water need to make the primary decisions. So I'm going to back off, right? Because if that's what y'all want to do, our analysis 
our collective analysis of the study group was that we could win. Right? So for me, the, 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 where the clarity is, I'm thinking about my, we, we could win, right? Be it mayor or city council, we, we thought that we could win for a lot of different factors too long to account here, that we could win, and if they want to push for the win, that's fine. But the, the, the critical part is, for any of us who get involved in electoral politics, is defining what your win is, yes. and being very clear about that. Being very clear about that. Mm -hmm. Right, particularly given the nature of this state and given the nature of this system. And let me define what I mean by that. So there's, there's a phrase that many of you, I guess, who know me or follow me, that I've been repeating and I keep on repeating, because I think it's, it's a central piece. Number one, we got to be, I think, deadly honest as, as the left, that we do not have a sound theory of how to govern. We don't. Let's, and let's stop bullshitting that we <laughs> Like, we do not have a sound theory on how to govern, right? And some of that is our own fault, some of it not, right? Two, one thing we need to be clear on, though, even though we don't have that theory or it's incomplete at best, is that we need to be clear, I would argue, to the death at this point, that it is not our role and responsibility to seek office to think that we're going to manage the contradictions of capitalism. That is not our role. And if you think you're going to do that, you're going to wind up becoming a neoliberal. Because that, I agree with Margaret Thatcher, there is no alternative if you think that way. Right? There is no alternative, and you don't have the strength, or we don't have the strength to come up with something counter if we think we're going to use their logic to do something different than what's already being done. Could have been done for five right? years already. So keep those two things in mind. Uh, uh, I think in terms of like going forward to understand like if we're going to use this as a front of struggle, and I do think we should. Let me be clear about that. I'm not saying disavow it. I do think it's a legitimate front of struggle, particularly in this society and in other so-called Western bourgeois democracies. Uh, the, the weight of force behind it leaves us very little choice. Because we got to be clear, if you look at it, whether you agree or disagree with what's going on uh, in Catalonia right now, there's a couple of things I think that it really exposes is that at the end of the day, bourgeois democracy is, is, is really structured at the end of a bayonet. Like that is the ultimate choice that the Spanish crown and the Spanish state is really offering. Like you're going to go our way, or we're going we to beat the shit out of you, basically, one, one or the other. And like you really don't have many democratic choices. Your choices are only framed within this, in the paper called the Constitution, right? Which is just an agreement about whatever the contradictions were in 1776 or 1979 when they said there is a, right? And society has moved way, way beyond that, but you're supposed to stay in this narrow box. Right, which is the nature of how bourgeois order, you know, this so-called notion of the rule of law is, is framed. So um, uh, that said, uh, to understand, I think, a little bit more uh, about um, Cooperation Jackson explicitly. Um, so this is a vehicle that was created to execute one particular dimension of the Jackson Cush plan. That's a critical thing to understand, right? And, and that is the development of the solidarity economy. That is what Cooperation Jackson was designed and built to do, right? Um, now, why? And, and this is where you got to have a, a, a critical read of your own uh, particular unique circumstances. Right, wherever, whether it's Cooperation Humboldt or Cooperation Richmond, because all of these projects are going to, of necessity, look a little bit different mm -hmm. in response to the conditions of your area. So at here, one of the critical things is that we have to play a role, which is somewhat contradictory, we have to play a role of actually developing the productive forces here to meet the basic needs of the people who are here because there is not sufficient industry here to actually meet people's 
fundamental basic needs here. That does not exist. This is not a highly industrialized zone. This is not a place with excess jobs. The real unemployment rate in Jackson is probably close to about 50%. Wow. The real unemployment rate. So any day of the week, you can knock on almost any door in any house, any community in this, in this city, and you're going to find an able-bodied, you know, working, uh, uh, working, capable adult in that house answering the door, which just gives you an indication that between 9 and 5, there's somebody there who could be someplace else earning a wage under the normal rules governing the capitalist society. That is not. And that doesn't mean they're not working another job from, you know, 6 to 2 o'clock in the morning or whatever the situation is. But, you know, that just gives you a dynamic of where this economy actually is and what we actually have to and are trying to respond to. So there's part of it which is uh, uh, being a developer, but then there's also the part of it is how do you, for us, trying to figure out within the seeds of, of this new kind of development, how do you plant the basic elements of creating an anti-capitalist economic order? Because from our estimation, because it's so undeveloped, that's actually a lot of room for us to experiment with. And we also have to recognize, <coughs> don't underestimate, one, one thing I sometimes hate about our, our forces, and this is a product of growing up in Los Angeles, where, where a, a, a good lesson that I learned about uh, uh, growing up in LA. I'm not somebody that you ever have to convince that the, the working class can self-organize from my experience growing up in LA. Because I saw it. Now, many people might consider it an aberration of what was organized, right? But I grew up with what we used to call Los Angeles sets, right? Which many of y'all might call gangs. These are working class organizations. There ain't nobody taught them nothing from no Alinsky school or you know, no, no, nothing else, you know, that organized and created some of the most disciplined organizations I have ever seen in my life. All right? With their own internal structures, regardless of whether you agree with it or not. My point is, it, it demonstrates the ability of the class and the people to self-organize. Right? So, here in Jackson, that ability also exists. And already, there's an organic solidarity economy which exists in Jackson. It's not something that we have to organize, it already exists. And it could be as simple as sharing sugar with your neighbor, doing child care, you know, uh, uh, for a family, friend, or a relative. And to understand, from an intellectual point, talking about theory going back to the beginning, that this is a basis to organize from, not a weakness of the class itself. Right. Thank you. Right? It's a basis to organize from. The, the, the issue is, can we tap into it to give it more concrete political direction? That's the challenge of, let's like, say, a more organized force, which is coming in with its theories and beliefs and trying to match that with the organic practices of the people in the community. Now, I would say right now, we are not there. I, you know, we're too young to be there. We're too, too new to be there. There's too many questions about our capacity and our ability to be there. But I think also always having that theory in mind that the people are going to organize to meet their own basic needs. So how do you tap into that as a political force, right? And then use that in a way which is not just about, I'm eking out a survival, but use it as a strength to say, we can build upon this to build the capacity to create the abundance that we could all that we all should have, and that the productive, productive forces actually enables us to have, if there was a different set of, a different dynamic of ownership, and if there was a different dynamic of distribution, right? So our question, you know, at least on the local level, is in part a productive one, but in the greater sense, it's a question of distribution, which is tied to the direction of ownership, right? And that the folks who own are not going to distribute based upon need. They're going to distribute based upon profit. So how do we divest them of their ownership to be able to, to, to distribute based upon need? So that gets to back to another, another particular point, is that uh, um, we want everybody, we want everybody to be clear that, that we see cooperation as a vehicle of working class organization. And that's critical because co-ops are not always viewed in that way. 
people in co-ops necessarily don't always view them in that way. And without some core political anchors, we've seen co-ops in other communities wind up being instruments of gentrification, right? Not instruments of actually enabling and empowering the working class. So again, the political focus and, have, and animus has to be clear. And the choices that we make around who we ally with, why and why not, also have to be clear. Um, now, that said, the, the, uh, Bruce, I, I was trying to, in general way, ask some questions, but Bruce asked a particular question, and so did uh, uh, David. That's more about uh, now. Um, the question about the, the, the affiliation with the Democratic Party. First thing to understand is that Mississippi has what's called a fusion line here, which a lot of southern states have. And that means uh, there's another organization that exists here that's a product of the struggle here called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Which has a fusion access has a fusion line to the Democratic Party platform and program. Right? I mean, uh, that platform and program, excuse me, to the, to the primary, right? So you can run as a member of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party under the Democratic Party primary. And what's critical to understand here is that up until 1968, the Democratic Party was fundamentally a Dixiecrat party here in the state of Mississippi. But because the Democrats, at least on a national level, uh, were viewed as the party, at least in most black communities, particularly those in the North and the West, as one that gave more access to issues concerning black people, black folks here were trying to buy into or be a part of that New Deal coalition uh, uh, that existed in this primary seat in, in places like Chicago and Detroit and New York and you know Boston and Los Angeles, which was not an open door here. So the effort in 1964 and 1968 by the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party uh, was to break that barrier so that they can have, for some people anyway, so they can have an entry into uh, that machine. Now it's critical to note that there's some people like Fannie Lou Hamer, which made, go back and look, she said, you know, I question America, right? Uh, and there was some divisions and split that never really fundamentally got resolved from that time forward of which we keep playing this drama in the cycle that I think Bruce spoke so eloquently about, right? Uh, we keep acting like there is no history and precedent to our actions and decisions and keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. And we are not remiss of making those mistakes in my own individual view here in Jackson. Right, and I'll get to that to, in this question. So, uh, because this particular vehicle exists and because it has a history, a history, like a radical history in Mississippi, uh, there had already been somewhat autonomously, a number of members of MHG, of Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, who had already affiliated a long time ago with the Mississippi Freedom Democratic so Party. So what clarification, so is, uh, uh, on the ballot line, <coughs> as you organize and, and do your work, are you a member of the Democratic Party, period, and then nudge, nudge, wink, wink, a Mississippi Freedom Democrat, or on the ballot line, are you either a Democrat or a Mississippi Freedom Democrat? Because that, that, definitionally that helps to, when you talk about you use it as a front of struggle and a way to educate and organize, I'm just trying to understand how ordinary folks think about it. It's the former. Here, here, so I'm sorry? It's the, it's the former. It's just a former, not the latter. Thank you. Just a That's how. All right. So cause That's the, the thing to understand here, which is a complication here, uh, it's a challenge, it's an organizing challenge, right? And why it's not like, it, it wasn't like it's a simple de debate. Um, so to be, for fundamentally, not exclusively, fundamentally to be a Democrat in this state means to be black. To be a Republican in this state means to be white. Everybody needs to understand this, right? When, when you think about the specificities of this place, okay? That's how it's articulated. So you can look at a map, you can pull up a map right now from hell, the last 40 years, and you look at red and blue, 
And if you look at that, and then you look at a demographic map of the state, it'll, it'll line up perfectly. Everywhere where there's a majority black district, that, that area goes for the Democrats. Everywhere it's majority white, that area goes to the Republicans, without exception. Be clear about that. Without exception. Right? So to be white here is to be a Republican. Right? In terms of the actual expression of how it turns out, and to be black here is to be a Democrat. So for, for us in our project, we had to, to make uh, some distinctions as to do you go with the common motion of the people as they are already articulated and organized, or do you go with an alternative? That's an unsettled question here in Jackson. Okay, I want everybody to be clear. That's an unsettled question here in Jackson. I can only speak for Kali Akuno. Kali Akuno has already always articulated the politics. The Democrats are our enemies. Let's create the distinction, a clear distinction, which is not the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, right? So I was willing to go with that initially in 2009 as a compromise based upon the history, right? With the, with the, the, the caveat, which we made a the, the, uh, uh, determination that at that point in time, we were either going to build the, the Democrat, the Freedom, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party into a real instrument or create a new one, right? Neither has, has happened. <laughs> okay, neither has happened, all right? Uh, now, why I think is a subject of debate and where the other narratives come in. Neither has happened. Uh, so to me, it was a compromise made in error. I'm gonna just be honest with everybody, that was a compromise made in error. On my part, I, I, the other people have to speak to their part. But that was a compromise made in error. Uh, and I think it was a compromise made in error because it's, it's, it's convenient to go with the existing structures and the traditions in, in, in history as it is, you know, rather than trying to pose the question, well, why are you separating yourself from the Democrats? Understanding that to be a Democrat here is to be black. So it's, that, that's a legitimate question. I'm not, I, I'm not trying to minimize it. That's my own personal position for a lot of different reasons. But that's a legitimate question that has to be waged and has to be honestly answered here. Right? And I think a lot of different places, I, I can just speak about here, that has to be answered here. And I think that it goes to Bruce's question. One of the things that then makes it difficult, uh, I think by making that compromise, is that it became very difficult to challenge Obama. Right? About the policies that he was making. And, and increasingly would make it difficult to challenge the existing administration without being posed as somebody who's just opposed to it and not necessarily raising principal criticism to actually stay the course hater. or go in a more left direction. Hater. Right? That <laughs> hateration. Yeah, that you hate. As opposed to, no, I'm offering the criticism because I wanted to go in a positive direction, not because I wanted to see it destroyed or undermined. Right? And so that's a critical piece. And so I, I would say, like right now, there's a, there's a, um, you know, there's a struggle that I think there's a, there's a section of, of the, the forces involved in the Jackson Cush plan here, which I think is deliberately aligning itself with a fraction of the Democratic Party, right? Particularly the, the Bernie fraction, but not exclusively. That is doing that. Uh, and then there's another tendency of which I'm on, which is saying, no, we need to go in a totally different direction uh, than that. Uh, and we are still trying to figure out how to strategically work and relate to each other in terms of keep advancing the Jackson Cush Plan strategy. Right? Because at this point, I don't think there's necessarily like major strategic difference, like shift in such a regard as like, I, we, I just can't work with you no more. Right, it's like, you know, you going that way, and I don't think that's, that's the way to go, you know. Uh, um, and so I've I got to go this way, right? But I still see, you know, kind of trying to work at least in parallel towards going to the same one. So there's the same direction, so it's like there's an experiment to see which is going to work, right, to a certain extent. Uh, but, you know, the, there are some things 
Uh, so for me, and, I'll, and then I'm going to shut it down and answer more questions. I told some folks here last night, I've been on record before publicly, you know, I didn't think Antar should run this time around. Well, I think the uh, Bruce left. Uh, or not, I mean, uh, David left and somebody asked him other questions. I didn't think that Antar should run, and it speaks to some, the two people asked about, like, the conditions which enabled this to happen, right? So, you know, four years ago, uh, just to cite one thing, four years ago, uh, or, hell, six years ago now, really, to be honest with you, uh, 2012, we go back five years ago, 2012, when we first started gearing up to run Chokwe for mayor, the city of Jackson had a surplus in the budget. Had a surplus in the budget. That doesn't mean it was good time, just mean that the city wasn't in debt, all right? And 20, from 2014 on, basically, 2015 on, from 2015 on, you know, uh, uh, when we were out of office, and a result of a lot of decisions, which are too, too much to recount here, the city has been in debt ever since, okay? So if you just look at that, it speaks to a different condition. Now, one of the things that we were already confronting, and that was on the radar screen as early as 2012, there was one major threat that was already emerging. In 2012, the city of Jackson was, <coughs> was forced to accept a consent decree by the Environmental Protection Agency to fix its water system or else, basically, is what those wind, wind up being. So that was entered into an agreement before uh, Chokwe became mayor. Everybody should be clear about that. And the terms were set for before he became mayor. But here's the thing. Whether you agree to the terms originally or not, once it's set in stone, you may be able to renegotiate, but the terms are set, right? So that's what we walked into. Now recognize that consent decree alone necessitated that, that Jackson had to do an estimated two, was it, $2.5 billion worth of repairs over a course of like 17 years. The average annual budget in the city is about $700 million. Yes, it's not that big, right? It's not that big. So we were already staring down I have to make about 10 years of my annual budget to pay for these repairs. And that's just one project. They were coming down with others around infrastructure that also had to be repaired. So the, the, my thinking was, cut it short, was we are being forced into a dynamic, not of our own creation, wherein the immediate choice, if you don't do anything drastically different, the immediate choice is how do you administer austerity? How do you administer privatization? That was the immediate choice that we knew that we were going to have to stare down. And my opposition was that, look, the political strength is, is not here to think that we can win that on our own. And to enter office at this particular point in time means that you're going to have to find some way to negotiate being the administrator of austerity. I call it the Syriza trap, right? Like, you, you see the game, and if you try to enter this and aren't really clear about making a decisive break in some fundamental ways with the, with the order as it exists, the best that you can offer is, how do I administer the cuts a little bit easier than the other person who might administer the cuts? Like, that winds up being the practical choice under Tina. Like, there is no alternative to neoliberalism, right? So it's like, unless, my argument was then and now, unless we are really prepared to go in a, a really different direction, it does not help to be the force trying to manage the contradictions of capitalism. Because it winds up being a failure not only for us, it winds up being a failure for the left in general, right? And if you're going to make a serious break with things the way that they are, the fundamental thing to understand that I would argue with that is you better be prepared to go to war tomorrow. Especially if somebody asks the questions about 
real enemies, like, you know, or who's our opposition in, in, in this state, right? One of the beauties about Mississippi, uh, I consider the beauty, some people might, you know, but I consider the beauty. It's good from, from somebody growing up in Los Angeles with, with, with a ton of white liberals around, <laughs> right? It, it's good to be in a place where it's very easy to discern at least your vocal <laughs> enemies in opposition. Thank you. Right? It's, it's, it's very refreshing to know you're on the other side of the table and we, just, we don't agree. So I don't have to really do a lot of hard thinking about what you're planning on doing. And you make it very clear every day, you know, what you think about me and what you're planning on doing. And that makes organizing people on a certain level somewhat easier. Because it's like, I ain't got to convince them that there's an evil, somebody evil planning to do something evil to them. What they want to know is, I know that already. What are we going to plan? What are we doing about it? What can we do about it? Right? And so that's a different leap, a different set of questions. But I don't have to convince people that they exploited and oppressed. That, that's not something here. That's a good, that's a good set of questions good, they had out there because yeah. when we talk about fascism in Berkeley, it's a whole different ball. Quite so, so we, there's real enemies to, to the overall project. And one of the reasons why I said that despite like a lot of the differences that exist in the here and now, and I've, I've only touched on the surface, this is the reality, I think, you know, at, at least as a, as a role of a, of a leader here to a certain extent, that I'm trying to caution people about. We need to fight out all our differences as best we can between now and January. Because January, the state legislature takes office, and then our differences amongst each other wind up becoming very petty and very minor real quick. Absolutely. <laughs> right? Because we, we know what they're planning on doing. Right, so part of the thing is, I, I'm not worried about disagreeing with you now because I know I'm gonna have to be walking on the same side of the battlefield with you come, come January. Because that enemy doesn't really care about whether, you know, uh, uh, I want to set up a cooperative and you don't. They really could give a shit, right? They like, we don't want black people having shit. And we're going to make sure that y'all don't have shit because we're the, we the super majority in this legislature and we can make up almost any rule that we want. So that's the real opposition that we have we have here. So it's like being mindful of what the scorecard is at the end of the day, right? And so it's like to the extent that I'm going to struggle with, with folks who I have some disagreements with, they have to be, are these contradictions of an unresolvable character or are they contradictions of something that we can resolve? Then it becomes the question, if it's the latter, how do we resolve them? We don't resolve them by ignoring them. We don't resolve them by acting as they don't exist. We don't resolve them by acting in history as an example doesn't exist. We don't resolve them by acting like there's no lessons that we can learn from either our own experience or those around us. We don't act like our, our four support personality is greater than history and greater than the laws of, of economics and society. That's not, that's not a help, right? So, um, I so think how do they get resolved? You got to resolve them through struggle. And sometimes that struggle is not pretty. Sometimes it's not, you know, uh, 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 clean. Uh, uh, but that's the only way you ultimately go on, go on resolve, you know, uh, basically. But I think so, you know, the other thing is, I think we need to be clear on long game and short game, right? And I would argue that, that, at least in terms of, of me trying to be a strategist, that every single short-term move I make has to reinforce the long-term. And for me, making uh, uh, temporary compromises with the Democrats does not actually help the long-term game. And that's one of the strategic like arguments and differences that, that we, we are having right now. Uh, and that's a tough one because we see, um, and I think a younger generation is going to have to kind of figure some of this stuff out on their own, uh, and they, they definitely are. But you see automatically, like like right now, uh, for instance, there's the, the then I'm gonna stop so uh, and answer more questions. So like the the movement for Black Lives uh, uh, just announced a major uh, just announced a major project on Monday. That they're coming out with this, this, this uh, voter uh, justice project. And I think that we have to wage a principal struggle with those of us who are friends with some of the folks in this motion 
to understand, like I understand in part what you what your aim and objective is, but as a student of history, I also got to, to caution you or warn you and struggle with you about being having your energy mo motion and energy being appropriated by an enemy force, as as in the Democratic Party and its structure, mm -hmm. and then that is in fact what you are enabling under this notion that. Uh, you can change the character and the political course of where this empire is going in 2018, right? By electing more Democrats, right? Uh, as if we, we should do, and the thing that we need to caution people about is like, okay, uh, is there a distinction between Trump and, and say, Hillary? We would, be, we would be foolish to say that they aren't some, right? We don't need to lie with some people and say that they aren't some. So like for instance, you know, Hillary uh, uh, wouldn't go after abortion in the way that Trump was going about it. Like that's a real thing. She wouldn't go after healthcare in the same way that Trump is going after healthcare, right? So those are real things. But at the end of the day, remember, she didn't support universal health coverage. Yep. And has been very adamant against it. So they still going in the same direction. They just got different tactics on how to get there. Mm. One is neoliberal, right. one is the conservative. Yeah. Right. <laughs> they just got a little different tactics on, on getting there. And us being clear that our ultimate interests in alignment don't align with theirs, even in the short term. Mm -hmm. It really don't align with them. So you fortifying their position is not helping your long-term position. Right. Right? It is actually undermining, I would argue, your long-term position. But that's a struggle that I think we got to get people to, to understand and to wage in the in, and to wage in the struggle with people principle. So I'm gonna end there. I don't know if Adolfo or other folks might have something, you know, that you might want to offer that's slightly different or a different uh, narrative. There's a lot to, to digest. I tried to cover a broad uh, sweep, but we got time for more specific questions. I'll try to take those. initially was saying that the, the first uh, Lumumba should run. Um, so I'm curious what you thought the benefit of that was and if you see any benefits to to like the current mayor. Like, do you see any benefits in terms of the movement work that you're doing to have that mayor in office? Well, let me back up. So if it wasn't clear, uh, I didn't, me pushing him to do it uh, was because he was the most uh, visible person in our organization in this chapter here uh, 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 to do that. Uh, the objective was to gather information, it was not to actually, not to elect per se. Not because I didn't think it was possible, but for me gathering the information to do the base building for the more primary. And so one of the things that, that I'm uh, frustrated with is that after you know virtually 10 years of pursuing this project, we won three elections, but we still don't have that information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What information is that? I wanted to know, you know, how many people in, it, in this community actually believe in what we believe in. Mm -hmm. But in order to figure that out, I have to clearly articulate what it is that we believe in, however unpopular that may be. My point is that that's five percent of the population. That's five percent of the population that we can organize with and then build and extend upon. But you know, to win an election, and this is one of those those pieces. To win an election, we didn't present our full program. We didn't present the full piece. So people align with what was put out there, but they may or may not know anything more. And I would argue some people, a lot of people, don't in this community. They don't know anything really more about the the politics and orientation of the Malcolm X grassroots movement. Even though that is the organization behind this, that has won the elections, they're not any more clear necessarily about that. I don't see that as a game. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. It's okay. Still politics in two dimensions. Right. I, that, I don't see that as a game. Yeah. But, say Bernie did this. Uh, but for <laughs> yeah. me, so for me, thinking about the long term game, right? If we would only gotten say 500 people to vote for us, the way things are here that you can do ultimately. That's 500 new contexts that I didn't have before, but I can go knock on the door and be like, yo, you, me and you believe in the same thing, let's build something together and let's work on it, right? Us having the organization and the capacity of 500 people is the first basic elements of power, right? And so let's say if there was 5,000 people, 
I'm after the power. I can give a damn about what the office can do for four years. I want to know can, what can we do for the next 400 years, you know, the next four, 40 years. So now to, to, to answer part of your question, are there some things that the office can do? Absolutely, that, that it, it can do. And are we going to try to push it to do that? Yes, we are, right? So it's not like we just ignoring it or think it has no, no use value at all. Uh, we think it does, but I think that the, the, the principal thing is, you know, one of the things that Cooperation Jackson has kind of learned somewhat on its own is about being strategic about when to say what, right? Because some of the stuff that we put out about uh, uh, human rights and climate change, you know, just the mere mention of it has, has led to the introduction of bills you know, by by uh, these 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 neo Confederate forces to stop it, and we ain't even got nothing off the ground yet that even indicates that you know this is possible, right? But they like, oh, okay, you know, we see where y'all going, we're gonna stop. cut that off. They have clarity. They, yeah, they got they clarity. Got clarity. Yeah. So it's one of these things of like, even with the mayor, right, and that being an, an ultimate, like you know, a generally allied force. We have to make some judgments. How much do we want to push, given the dynamics, the overall balance of forces in this state? And it may be better to just do, on a certain level, right? What's the old saying? You know, the do it first and ask permission later. So it may be better to just do it as opposed to just trying to have it legislated because the state legislators will come and block. That's really right. So on a certain level, it's like kind of what use is it? That, that really needs to be evaluated, particularly if if we're not all in agreement that this is what we're going to throw down about. That we're going to go fully to, 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 to bat with these forces right now. And I think that's one. This is what I mean by managing the contradictions of capitalism to a certain extent. You know, uh, one of the things that Antar is having to, to try to figure out is straight up, where can I compromise with these people, and where do I fight them? Right. And that's a, that's a, because if, if you're in the if you're in the mentality of, of I'm trying to govern, that's what governing means, right? Of this system, right? Compromises, and it's like, do you want to fight on every single battle, right? Do you have the forces to win every single battle? And making a serious assessment, you have to say, no, I don't, right? And so it's like, did you prepare your part of the thing? Watch in the long term game. Did you prepare yourself to actually win? Mm -hmm. As opposed to just playing the game. And that, that's two radically that's two radically different things. I'm, like, I'm, I'm getting more to the point. I'm not interested in playing the game. I'm interested in, in winning. Right? Governance means more than just compromise. It means maintaining the status quo, which was not the impetus of what the uh, Jackson Cush plan was supposed to do. It was supposed to be a, a radical experiment in, in uh, revolutionary change and upheaval of the status quo in the state of Mississippi. So it could be a model where other people can take from it and where it applied, try to do certain things. And I think one of the uh, primary problems was there was too much emphasis placed on the electoral piece and not the organize. There was no balance there. Um, so it was like people really wasn't paying attention to the theory that was put down in the Jackson Cush plan because there was, and to a certain extent, I think um, the capacity was not here in Jackson in terms of the local chapter to really build this kind of dual power with the people's assembly along with the electoral piece and other pieces that are laid out in the Jackson Cush plan. So you end up starting off on a path where you kind of from the outstart, you really kind of doomed to to be in this kind of position. I want to say fail, but yeah, because yeah, I will say fail because compromising in this, in this particular kind of instance, instance in a way that people are compromising from my standpoint, that is a failure for the whole program and it's a failure for the whole movement. And now you got a national reverberation where people are trying to recreate this kind of electoral thing where they don't really have a deeper understanding of what's going on on the ground here in Jackson 
and now you got forces from other areas that are coming in and compromising and co-opting it and taking that energy and moving it and even giving it credit to places that it shouldn't be giving credit to. So, would you be willing to, to say, when you say forces coming in, trying to co-opt it, I don't, the struggle for clarity. Like, could, could we, could you share with us in your perspective who that is? Well, well it's really just in terms of what I'm talking, like what Bruce yelled out a few minutes ago, like people like Bernie Sanders taking credit for like the victory here in Jackson with the, uh, election of Shokwe Antar. I don't know much about the guy in Birmingham and what his relationship was, but even with that, just talking about those articles coming up. Because I can't really speak directly to the uh, electoral process this time. I participated in Shokwe Lumumba's election and then the run that Shokwe Antar had after Shokwe Lumumba died. But I didn't participate in the uh, election process this time. I voted, but I didn't, I didn't really, because like Kali, I spoke with him and I told him that I thought he shouldn't run for some of the same reasons that uh, Kali articulated, but it was a point of disagreement and people, he, everybody has the choice to move forward and do what they want to. So. Whoever controls the food controls the people. <laughs> Can you say that louder? Um, I want to know uh, what he thinks about the strategy in the future of using whomever controls the food controls the people. I'll, I'll say that a, a, a cornerstone of Cooperation Jackson strategies is building the capacity to be food sovereign. Amen. For that very, <laughs> for that very reason. But all you know, so it. It, if we do it right successfully and to scale, uh, we can create uh, a, an anti-capitalist alternative to meet people's basic caloric needs. So that's an aim and objective that it's going to take us some time and political struggle uh, to accomplish. But we started off with that. I, 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 I would like to be of service in that capacity. It's, it's part of my expertise as an environmental artist. Other questions? Um, I don't think I'm familiar at all with, um, I don't even talk about theory, but modern monetary theory. <laughs> <laughs> which, which division of monetary, monetary? I feel like we should talk about that. I the only thing how exactly how money is created in the banking and capitalism. Who? Uh, it's a, it's a oh, you said the theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The government has to spend money before it can tax it. And let's, let's say we paid off every dollar of debt that ever existed, the American dollar that ever existed. There would be zero dollars left. How would we pay more in taxes? And so we would have to spend money to do this. Somehow, somehow distribute it to us for us to be able to pay. And my idea was, I'm not sure about the reality of this is, is to try to run a second uh, currency alongside of the dollar, one that's supposed to the people, since it's too much of a, of a battle to try to take the money away from the rich. You know, they don't want to tax, and people have the whole idea of the bootstraps, and we shouldn't take money to go so rather than do that, we can find these things ourselves with our own currency. So, I, so I'm familiar with some aspects of that, and I have major disagreements with. It. Yeah, we can talk about if like because that was when you said Syriza and Reese, that was actually one of the major hypotheses that was put forward by Yanis Varoufakis, who was the, the, the finance minister, and he, and he had a plan B that was kind of tracking along this modern monetar monetary theory. I think that um, given the organizational forces, again, it has to do with capacity, it has to do with feeding people, it has to do with the actual material things. I think that under certain organizational circumstances, it could be one way of transitioning, but not by itself. That's the thing. A lot of MMT um, uh, advocates think that that is the mechanism, but it's not. It's a tool. 
and it can only be used if the material forces are on the ground to actually make it happen, right? I mean, uh, 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 AMI <laughs> and the, the bank's theory of money works because they have the power and they have the productive forces behind it, right? So the, it, it's, it's, it's a thing that it's like, in order to answer that question, you have to move it off of the question of money. Does that make sense? And onto the material organization of people. Good summary. <laughs> I mean, she summed it up. So the only thing that I would, would, would add to it and I would, I would start with is like, at the end of the day, you, you're still not dealing with the sovereign power, power mm -hmm. of, say, the United States government. Mm -hmm. And you're still not dealing with who owns and controls the means of production. Mm -hmm. Right? So you can have another currency, but if they still control all the land, yeah. And all the machines, not right? And all the resources, you know, it's it's fun to play with monopoly money, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they still gonna send drones and, and armies and uh, you know everything else that they have at their disposal to keep us in check. Or they can serve us out. Local currency is not monopoly money, and they can serve purposes. No, I didn't mean it. I don't, we're trying to create a local currency, so that don't, I'm not trying to demean it at all. Okay. I'm just, I'm just, but, 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 but that, that's a whole, yeah, it has, has to be backed by something, so I'm not trying to demean it, but I'm just saying that just thinking about, uh, uh, thinking that that's going to do it in and of itself. Yes. Yeah. That's right. And only I'm saying that listen, it's not, it's, it's got to be more than local, Yes. Let, let me put it to you this way. This is something I always, when, when, when uh, I do political education as a principal, I always tell people, you have to make a decision whether you're going to fight now or later. <laughs> That's the critical question that you're going to have to, to raise. Because, you know, the, the, the ruling class is not giving up one inch of this shit without a fight. And to think that just because, you know, we can get a municipality to do this and, like, go its own way, and they're not going to send in the Army, Navy, Marines, and the drones, I think we're kidding ourselves, right? And so, basically, we have to get... Yeah, you, we still, the, the fundamental piece of why I said she, she, some, we have to organize people, mm -hmm. yep. right? At, at the end of the day, you're going to have to organize people, concrete, living, breathing, human beings, uh, to do any of this. And then you have to get them prepared for the consequences that may come from challenging this system without, you know, being too idealistic. And then, the, I think, to one of the system's component, like, can we prepare for people well enough to not replicate the logics of the systems that we have been embedded in the past 500 to 10,000 years or more? I'm sorry. Um, so if, uh, let's talk about the Bitcoin mining and the Bitcoin mining I mean, um, number one, food sovereignty is, is this, this, what we mean by that is a basic unit of measurement. And our unit of measurement is Jackson. Now, why, do, why, do, why am I saying that? It's because there's a certain way in which Jackson cannot be food sovereign. It cannot. Uh, you know, because it's not like all the water that we need to do everything, you know, to produce all those crops exist just in Jackson. Um, no even as we dug, you know, a bunch of wells in, into the Let's aquifer, advance all that you know, we can we advance probably, you know, within this particular that like unit of existence where we can kind of ex exercise some power, but it's, it cannot be divorced from trying to transform the rest of society, right? So, um, um, 
So I'm, 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 I'm complicated in just recognizing that it has to be complicated. Like, I'm going to do everything I can to get free here. But just, even if I got it as, as good as it can be here, doesn't mean that I'm free. Right? In the context of still being controlled or having to live under the system, you know, of sovereignty of the United States government or the capitalist system or patriarchy. Like, I'm not going to be divorced from that just by having a good here in Jackson. Now, my first order is to figure out how to organize Jackson to, to best get to that point. And so for us, um, I'm going to just break it down. For us, it's like, you know, um, we have to, to, as I see it, figure out concrete ways of strategically extracting ourselves from the logic of the system itself. And so one of the things that I would point to, uh, which has its own dynamics, like we've been uh, acquiring uh, uh, as much land as we can is, is one of the primary things that we've been trying to do, you know, here in, in, uh, as Cooperation Jackson, right? Um, uh, a, property is still relatively cheap. It's not going to remain that way here. Uh, but the, the primary thing is to, for us, is to hold that land in, in trust, in community land trust, and to take as much of it off the speculative markets as possible to, in essence, you know, do a, 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 a layer of decommodification of it, and then put it to use primarily in two, three fundamental ways. The first is to, you know, uh, make some shifts towards local food production. Right to meet that, that food sovereignty kind of goal and objective. The second element is to uh, stabilize housing by, by building in permanent affordance uh, in the housing to keep the character of the community like as it is as an anti-gentrification like element and strategy. And the third particular piece is uh, to to put it to direct use. Uh, in the service of, the, the, of how we are trying to democratically own and control the new technologies that are emerging, right? That we want to we want to get ahead of the curve and put you know digital fabrication into the direct service of our community, not into the direct service of those who own and control capital as the president is. So those are kind of our aims, goals, and objectives. And right now we have. We have a land trust, you know, that, that's up and running. About 50 plots of land that we own here now, plus this building. Um, uh, we're, we're trying to gradually scale up, you know, the, the, the food production, and we've gotten primarily a, a, a crew of young folks who ain't never farmed before. So they're trying to figure all this out. They're learning a lot of hard lessons in the in the process around what to plan, when to plan, and how to do it. And um, so there, there's a learning curve that's there, and then we got a small crew that's working, you know, just getting started uh, 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 with the two buildings that we just recently acquired across the street to do what we call the community production uh, uh, center, which is trying to, you know, take this uh, digital fabrication world and, and all this fourth generation technology, democratize it and put it into direct service. Now, there's a lot of issues and contradictions that we are still trying to figure out. Because for us, there's there's three things, like just on that one initiative, that we're still trying to think through, right? So uh, one piece is that we want to get to community, what we call community production, right? But we still are, have to be realistic about and, and, and understand. I don't mean realistic in a narrow sense, but uh, we are still going to be tied into, you know, existing commodity markets as they exist to even get that off the ground, right? And so we're still going to be producing commodities, you know, that I think is a dominant thing for a while to subsidize what we want to do with community production stuff, which is to produce for, for use and for need directly as opposed to produce, producing, you know, to make a profit. But that's going to take some time, right? And so the, this technology is at a stage where there's still exponential growth, but it's still not say, it still can't be some of the traditional methods of producing things in mass that other things can do. So for us, it's like we're taking a calculated risk 
and rolling the dice for us is like we got a limited amount of resources and making this investment is taking the risk because I can't I can't promise you that there's like a, a return at the end of the day that's going to come from this decision but it's like we, we're seeing the wave of the future and where it's going right and, and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, I, I'd rather take a risk on us finding out ways that we, we utilize all this uh, in a democratic way to service our needs than to leave the ownership and control over these machines to a small group of people who increasingly need us less and less and less. Because one of the things that we have been arguing for, and this may be a contra controversial point, but I make an argument that we are already in a disposable age, and what that means is that uh, mass programs of genocide are on the agenda. And we need to be clear about that. So it's not just that the Rohingya are some isolated group that something weird is happening to right now. Like, that we would be foolish to believe that, when, especially when we look at it and analyze. There are more people enslaved now than there were 200 years ago. There are more people uh, uh, on the move, either inside of their own quote unquote countries or you know somewhere on the planet who are being forcibly moved because of if they can't farm, they can't live off the land, either because it's been privatized or you know uh, programs like RED or, or, or seizing indigenous land in the forest and forcing people to move uh, or they just can't make a living, right? And, and are, are moving in mass from Central America South America, the Caribbean, to here or to Europe, from Africa, Asia, etc. So it's like there's this conjuncture piece. Like we are already living uh, in a massive period of upheaval. Like right now, like not in the future. The, the, the and whether it becomes a dystopia real quick is actually contingent upon the decisions that those in this room actually make. That's a challenge I want to put out to us. Like whether it goes in a certain direction, like our little bitty decisions make a decision and have an ultimate impact on which way this ultimate thing is going to go. So we are not insignificant players, I think, in the ultimate march of this game, despite how you know insignificant we may feel or isolated we may feel. Like the stakes are, are so high right now that small decisions, you know, it's like the butterfly effect. You know, a butterfly flaps his wings and then there's a crash in the stock market. Like we're there. We are, we are really there right now, and I think we have to kind of recognize that. Can you just say how you got people to invest in that vision and share that vision even though it's a vision? It's an ongoing process. I, like, I, I wouldn't, you know, like, um, uh, the success that we have had to the extent that we've had, as, as I was explaining to folks last night, has been uh, a large a large degree of political sacrifice, a lot of self-exploitation, you know, to get us to this point, uh, which I think the, the latter is definitely not necessarily sustainable.